Well, I'm honored today to uh, welcome our speaker, uh, Professor uh, Rahim Benekahal is uh, going to be presenting today. Uh, he's been on the faculty at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Illinois uh, since 1987. He received his PhD at Ohio State in 1986. He's the director of the Traffic Operations Lab at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and director of the annual Illinois Traffic Engineering and Safety Conference. Uh, he teaches and conducts research in uh, traffic flow modeling and simulation, traffic flow theory, intelligent transportation systems, traffic signals, traffic networks, and in particular has been working on uh, rail highway grade crossing safety, which is going to be uh, a major subject uh, of his discussion today. He's the editor of the book, Traffic Congestion and Traffic Safety in the 21st Century, Challenges, Innovations, and Opportunities, published by the American Society of Civil Engineers. He sits on the editorial board of multiple journals, including uh, the Journal of Intelligent Transportation Systems, and he was the co-director of the previous Region 5 UTC called Nextran. Uh, and without further ado, I'll let uh, Professor Benekal uh, start. Well, thank you very okay. much, Max. Uh, uh, we want to have it on so okay. people I see. in internet land can hear you. Okay. All right. Okay. So just put okay. that in your pocket. Sure. Uh, is that good? Perfect. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a uh, privilege and an, honor, and an honor for me to come and talk with you about the projects that we have been doing for a few years. Um, part of the funding for this project came from uh, the Roadway Safety Institute here at University of Minnesota. My co-author, a grad student that works a lot on this project and knows probably more than I do, is Jacob Matthews, but he's not here. So if, if I'm saying something you don't know, or if I start talking in language you don't understand, that's the time to stop me and ask a question. So I sometimes switch and talk in a different language. So if you see that, then just raise your hand and say, what are you talking about? Okay. Um, the outline is uh, motivation data, model forms we used, model development, accident uh, adjustment to the history of accidents. Comparison between the models and then some conclusions at the end. Uh, the motivation for us, you know, there are many reasons for doing this study, but if we just look at um, the number of uh, crashes in Illinois, you can look at Minnesota or any other state. So we have about 619 crashes in the past five years in Illinois. Look at the percent of fatalities, that's about 13%. Okay, um, sorry, I'm getting ahead. That wasn't the button I wanted to push, this one. 13%. And then add to that the percent injury, 28%. So together we have what? About 41% of the accidents are either injury or fatal fatalities at the crossing. Just contrast that one to highway highway accidents. In one year in Illinois, you know, similar data for other states, 1% of the accidents are fatal, 21% are injury. 13% were fatal, 28% injury. So when you are dealing with the railroad grade crossing accidents, you are not really dealing an accident that's similar to highway highway accidents. Okay? That clearly shows why. In addition, even if you have a PDO accident at the crossing, the damage that the PDO accident, property damage, okay? property damage only, the cost of property damage accidents at the railroad crossing is much higher than the property damage accidents at the highway. So it's important to pay attention to those. It's not just the numbers but it's the severity we have to keep in mind. Um, some of you may know that USDOT has an accident prediction model that uh, uses some variables to predict the number of accidents. Okay? And based on that, they do resource allocation, prioritizing what locations should be uh, improved, for instance, and so on. But uh, that formula, that accident prediction model, has limitations. One of them is, is aged. It was developed in 70s, so it's a long time ago they developed the model. You know, might have a better tools now than, than that time. And then um, 
there is not a strong match between the outcome of the model versus field data. Some states basically have given up on using that, including your state, that they are using a different procedure for ranking their crossings. And many other states, they use different version of that. So our objective was, is it possible to improve USDOT model or come up with a different model? Or is it still valid even though it was developed seven years? So many things we have discovered in the past, they are still valid. So that was motivation for us. So what we did is we analyzed grade crossing accidents at the macro level. By macro level, we are not looking at two, three, four, but we are looking at region or state level. To see whether the new methods can predict uh, railroad, grade, railroad grade crossing accidents better than uh, the USDOT model, okay? And uh, you'll see later that USDOT model, later on after development, they decided to do adjustment. And is that adjustment really the best way of adjusting it? Or can we come up with even better way of adjusting it? So with that in mind, we found two data sets uh, that we need information from. These are FRA, Federal Railroad Administration data sets, or some people, they say USDOT. More specifically, it's Federal Railroad, Federal Railroad Administration, FRA data sets. So those are the two data sets. One is giving you the, the, the characteristics of the accidents. One is giving you more characteristics of the location, in a way. And recently, they are switched the, the, the number of years that they are keeping data it used to be 10, now it's five years of data. They keep basically five recent years and then they update. So we are using whatever is available now. And then, uh, you know, most of you may know that, you know, when you are developing a model, you use a data set for that and you use a different data set for validation. You don't develop your model with the same data set and validate with the same data set. Okay. So we developed the model based on one data set, we are calling it model development data set, and then we validate it using completely different data sets. And data sets are filtered and then screened through a couple logical things that would basically weed out the points that they are not meaningful. Either they don't have data, or data is unreasonable, or data is not within even a reasonable range, you know, or errors and so on. So we can get to a, a kind of a clear data, okay, not raw data. So. This is the data set uh, we used for model development. All of this data is coming from Illinois. There are 629 public grade crossing in Illinois that had accidents. Uh, actually, that, I'm sorry, 6,259 crossings in Illinois that had uh, 376 accidents at 344 locations. And detail of that about, you know, how they were divided into crossbox, flashing light, and then gates are in that table. So roughly 375 accidents in 324 crossings. So that's model development data set. And then we use data from Iowa, Pennsylvania, Texas, and South Carolina for the same years. And combine the data from all those four states. And there we had about... Uh, uh, 1,184 accidents, of course, there's, uh, I'm sorry, there were 11,084 crossings. It's almost twice as much as in Illinois. And then there were 834 accidents at uh, 650, 697 crossings. So we felt that our validation data sets almost twice as the, the model development data sets. And the obvious reason is it's coming from four states. And we selected these four states because part of it is what data they, they provide, part of it was where they are located, part of it was looking at their size of uh, uh, railroad grade crossings. So try to be representative of many locations rather than picking all of them next to each other. Okay, in terms of what models we used, you know, we did a previous study, not this one, in the previous study, we explored different formats of the model. There we used the Poisson uh, model and the negative binomial model and zero inflated negative binomial model. And from that study, we concluded that 
zero inflated negative binomial model was better. Better in terms of prediction power of that was higher. It was giving results closer to the field data than the others. So in this study, we decided to use uh, zero inflated negative binomial model. So we developed models for cross box, uh, flashing lights, and gates, separate models for each. We looked at the variables that potentially could contribute to the accidents, and this is the variables we looked at. And we looked at them individually, we looked at them uh, sometimes, you know, combining them. For example, we combined these three as one variable, we combined those three as one variable, and we used others as they are stated to see, you know, which one of these variables are important or play a role in, in prediction of accidents. Then in terms of exposure measure, you know, traditionally people have used AADT, annual average daily traffic, and then total train volume, and different forms of that, you know, sometimes separately, like one AADT and train volume, total train volume, sometimes log of AADT and total train volume, sometimes log of AADT times train volume, sometimes log of the product, okay? So we, we explored all of them to see which one would represent more reasonable variable or exposure measure to the data. After looking at that, it looks like that log of AADT and total volume as an additive, not as a multiplication, uh, would be a better choice because it produced uh, this AIC values that are uh, lower. The lower AIC values are desirable in selecting that. And then those are the AIC values at the bottom of this slide you'll see. So we said, okay, we'll stay with that. So at least our exposure measure is going to be the log of AADT and then total train volume. Then the outcome of, I'm skipping several steps there, the outcome of the model development was that this is zero inflated model for gates and uh, um, I think those are model yeah, these are model development. So. so that's how the equation looks like as in the, in the top. And then, uh, and these are, what are the elements there? Of course, the, the, the exposure measure we talked before are there. Total terrain volume, log of ADT is there. As well as DNS is there. What's D? D is the distance to the nearby intersection. So there are three categories for the distance. Less than 75, 75 to 500, and the greater than 500. And then surface type, what type of surface you have at the crossing, what type of surface you have. And those, we group them. There are seven or eight entries in the FRA database. We end up showing them as unconsolidated wood, asphalt, rubber, concrete. Like some of the asphalt and concrete, they have subcategory. We just combine them. And then those are the values. Okay. Then we did something similar to this for flashing light. Okay, in the flashing light, the variables that showed up in addition to the exposure measure was highway speed and uh, again, surface type. So highway speed makes sense. You know, if you have flashlights, cars don't stop. They are still maintaining certain speed and they are passing through the crossing with a speed. And uh, surface type showed up as an important variable there too. By the way, this surface type is not the code that's given in the FRA database. FRA database randomly coded these seven or eight, like one, two, three, four, five, with no order, okay? If you use that variable, surface type doesn't show up as important. But if you go back and look at it and say, which one of these surface types would be kind of a top performing, uh, least amount of disturbance in traffic speed, and then which one would be the worst one? For example, if it is concrete, it's smooth, it's pretty solid, it's much, much better than if you have loose gravel. So we rank them in that order. So some of them end up being positive, some of them end up being negative. So then surface shows up as a factor, now because you are kind of logically ranking them, They're not, not the based on code they used. Based on code, it doesn't show up. Uh, 
We also did similar model for crossbox. Again, in the crossbox highway speed and S is there, and then those are the values that we are using for that. Okay. To summarize what the model elements were, in almost all of these models, regardless of the device type, total train is there, log of AADT is there. However, depending on the traffic control device you used, certain variables show up on some um, traffic control device and some others show up in another one. For example, highway to the nearest distance, distance to the nearest highway. That shows up in the gate. How far is the distance from the crossing to the nearest intersection? And while that doesn't show up on the flashing light and crossbuck, why is that? Why the distance is important there? Should it be? What happens if you have railroad crossing and the intersection close to each other? Right? The queue back up can spill over either intersection or spill to the railroad crossing. So distance is important. If the storage is not enough, traffic is red, and I am trying to cross the railroad crossing to go to the intersection. There is no storage for me. I'm stuck over the railroad track. Okay? So that's why it's playing a role. That doesn't happen on the crossbuck, because on the crossbuck, I'm just going to cross and go. There is nobody stopping me ahead of us. Similarly, why highway speed doesn't show up, for example, highway speed doesn't show up in the gates. Well, if the gate is done, everybody stops. Your highway speed is practically zero. But when you have flashing light, vehicles are not stopped. They are still moving. Or crosswalk vehicles are still moving, so speed shows up. So it made sense for us that these variables are showing up. Um, so that way, we developed the model. But after developing the model, you have to consider that this model, without making adjustment to the accident history, is not very powerful. USDOT model makes adjustments. Our model makes adjustments. You basically are looking at the history and considering the history as a component that contributes to your prediction ability. So your model gets much better when you introduce that. Otherwise, your models are really uh, far off, and then they don't capture the, the accident frequency on that location. So we have the option of two types of adjustment. One is, why don't we just use whatever USDOT is using? They have a formula, and then they compute that. Why don't we use that? And the next one was, well, what about if we use empirical beige method to accident history adjustment? So let's see what's the effect of those two. This is USDOT model. Some of you may be familiar. This small a is the value we compute as an initial prediction using the USDOT model. So that's your initial prediction. That you multiply by this and multiply, add this to that, it becomes USDOT adjusted model. Okay? So, and that's what we currently use. All days we used to use this. But they realize that this doesn't have a whole lot of power. They have to look at the history of the accidents. So this is their format. In a way, you can look at it and say that we are weighing A by this factor and adding another term to it. So that's another way of looking at it. So OK, fine. That's their way of dealing with it. So OK, how about if we develop an empirical beige method for adjustment, and if you divide develop that, you end up having an equation that looks like this. k times e plus 1 minus k times n, k is this value, and the variables are, are here. Here, what we are doing is we have an initial prediction using zero inflated model. So we are using zero inflated negative binomial model to predict this e, not to predict the final results. Then we are adjusting it to get the adjusted zero inflated negative binomial model, that would be comparable to field data. So this is the adjustment form anyway. And uh, we said, OK, why don't we take three models? And those three models are one obvious USDOT model. One is the one we developed, zero inflated negative binomial with uh, empirical beige adjustments. 
And one is kind of a middle ground between them. We, we use zero inflated negative binomial, but apply US DOT adjustment. Maybe their adjustment is better than this empirical base. So those are the three models I'm going to be presenting. And then three criteria we looked at it. So how do you judge one model is better than other? You know, the, the slope comparison, intercept comparison is not going to make a whole lot of sense here. Okay? So we said, well, how about if you look at it? Which one of those models uh, gets close to the field data in terms of cumulative number of accidents? And which one of them predict number of accidents versus actual number of accidents shows closeness? And how about relative ranking of the crossing based on predicted values? If your predicted value says that, okay, this location is number one, and this location is number two and number three and four, five, let's say, top five predicted from the model, and this is the field data, top one, top two. How many of these field data, the top five here, is showing in the top five here? If none of them are showing there, then there's a problem. Your model doesn't capture these top five locations or top ten top 15, top 20, however many you want. Yes. So that was a criteria to see that which model kind of captures that, which reflects the field data much better, closer. Okay. Then the rest of the results is showing you the outcome of those three criteria we used. Here what you see is uh, for gates, this is not model development. This is after you develop the model, you are applying to it four states to, together, combined. So field data shows that there were 474 crossings with 588 accidents. Okay? Those are the top 484 locations. And then we said, okay, fine. If we apply zero inflated negative binomial with empirical beige, how many of those top 444 locations and how many of these 588 accidents will be predicted by the model? As you can see, all of them. 474 and 588. Okay, if we use USDOT model, what happens? USDOT model found that in that 474 crossing, they found only 503 accidents rather than 588. And that the other one that's combination of zero inflated and then USDOT adjustment it actually performed lower than even this. So obviously this going in this direction doesn't seem to be reasonable. And graphs is basically showing that. It's 500, uh, 474 is here, kind of, the end of this line, roughly. Okay? And it shows that you know in the top one location, top five location, top 50 location, 150 location, how these are performing. Because you can see these two lines, this uh, yellow and then uh, kind of uh, brownish is not predicting well. It's always lower. It's a lot lower here. But the blue that's in the background and then this green, which is the zero inflated negative binomial with Bayesian, empirical beige, they are overlapping all along. Okay? This was for Gates. Similar results for uh, flashing lights. And again, basically looking at this numbers, and looking at these numbers, looking at these numbers, and looking at these numbers. Again, we zero inflate negative binomial with empirical beige, captured all the locations with all the accidents. This captured less, this captured even further less. Okay? And similar results for crosswalk. So I don't want to repeat the numbers, but it's just the same trend. Okay? As graphically you can see. So in summary, for all three warning devices, crossbar, flashing light, and the gates, uh, we have this that top crossing as sorted by USDOT model and, and zero inflated negative binomial with empirical beige uh, basically matched each other and zero inflated negative binomial model captured all those top crossings. As you reflected in that cumulative curve that was overlapping. The others you could see they're they're all blue. And we said, well, what about that may not be easily understood. Okay, there are a lot of things that you have to try to relate to each other. How about if we just do one-to-one -one comparison? Field versus predicted. Okay, we know how many accidents we had in the field. Well, how many accidents predicted? If they 
find all of them, there should be one-to-one -one relationship should be along this line, right? So if I have three here, they should have three. Two there, there should be two there. Three here should be three here, right? So as you can see, all three models that we are using, none of them is giving you one-to-one -one relationship, okay? But which one is closer? This is the one that's closest to that 45 line. These two are further. Which one is closest? This row inflated negative binomial model with the empirical ratio. Uh, this was for gates. Similar trend for uh, flashing lights. And similar trend for crossbox. So that's another way of looking at judging the, your models. So conclusion from those is that predicted values generated by zero inflated with empirical beige were closer to the field data than the others. Okay. I wish these points, we could come up with a prediction model that would put these points around this line. We didn't get it. But then we got something that's much better than these yellow dots or this light brown one. So, so relatively, it's a lot better in terms of absolute. We are not there yet. And the reason is obvious. We are using four variables here to capture all the variables that contribute to the accidents at the cross. So those four variables wouldn't be able to capture all of them. Okay. Uh, then okay, it's about the relative ranking. So let's look at the relative ranking. There are a lot of numbers here, but I want to call your attention to those that are kind of uh, circled. Okay. Let me explain what this data shows. If you look at one row of them, the other rows are repeated. Let's say if you look at top 10 crossing, this top n crossing. I have top 10 crossing in the field. field. I look at field data, top n crossing, top 10 crossings. In the field data, this shows that there were uh, 46 accidents. Uh, top 10 locations, 46 accidents. How many of them USDOT in the top 10 uh, accident ranked based on USDOT top 10. USDOT gives you top 10 locations. How many accidents were there? 38. There was 46 there, there is 38 here. And there's minor detail here, we'll skip that. Then similarly, top 20, you'll see that, top 30, you see? It just doesn't get there. It gets closer, but never is at that level. So that's what that explanation is on the side of that. Then, is this the same trend for flashing light? Okay. I'm sorry, that was USDOT model, right? This was all USDOT model. So how was it, how was it for the zero inflated negative binomial with empirical beige? There was in the top 10, there was 46. This captured all 46, 76, 76. As you see, all these numbers there are repeated here. So regardless of whether you're in top 10, top 15, top 20, top 30, it selects those crossings. All 100, let's say all 97 crossings that were ranked in the top, uh, all the accidents that happened in the top 30 locations, okay, we captured all of them basically with this model. This model says yes, it is. I can determine those crossings and then you end up basically finding the same number of accidents. Then if we go to flashing light, again, compare this column numbers here to the numbers here. Okay? You'll see that this is lower than that, lower, 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 lower. If you look at uh, zero inflated negative binomial with EB adjustments, it is the same, the same, the same, the same, the same. What I like to call your attention is I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. I am not saying that zero inflated negative binomial prediction is matching US matching field data. Like five accidents happen in the field data, zero inflated negative binomial gives you five. No. What it gives you this. If we take top ten locations there and then see in these top ten locations how many accidents happened, when you adjust it to the uh, when you apply E B adjustments to the predicted values, they also predict those 46 locations. The numerical values of the numbers they're predicting, the numerical value that comes out of the model 
is less than the numerical value that, that was in the field. But in terms of capturing all the top 10, it captures all the top 10. Anyway, it says, I found top 10 locations are these, and you go say, okay, in the top 10 location, how many accidents do you have? 46. So that means the ranking that zero inflated negative binomial finds is equal to the ranking was in the field. Top one is equal to top one here. Top two is equal to top two. Not the predicted value from top one added to the predicted value to top two is matching exactly the same number. The ranking matching. And if the ranking matching, the, the question becomes, you know, it's pretty easy. Uh, I have always underestimating the predicted values, but in terms of if I'm interested with the ranking, the rankings are captured. Okay. So these tables are representing that. So Crossbach, you know, this is, again, USDOT. This is zero inflated negative binomial. So that gave us that. Uh, looks like you are capturing that. If you are interested in finding and ranking your crossings, you know, this ranking gets you the crossing, the rankings that you're going to get from field data. So for all warning devices, top crossings identified using uh, zero inflated with EB adjustment had the same number of accidents in the field. Okay. Uh, top crossing identified by USDOT model could not capture all the accidents that were observed in the field. The reason they didn't capture it because they put rank two crossing here that wasn't in the field rank two. They put rank four crossing here that wasn't in the field, rank four. So as a result, you added, you added top 10 that they identified, it ended up being shorter than top 10 in the field because they misplaced some of those crossings in the rank that we observed in the field by a lower ranking crossings. So their ranking wasn't matching the ranking in the field. Um, so in conclusion, zero inflated negative binomial model was created for all the crossings, all the crossing, all, all types of traffic control devices at the crossings. And the last data that we used is the recent data. By the way, we had a previous study that I mentioned. There we used 10 years data, and that 10 year was 2014 to 2000, uh, 2004, 2011. Uh, in terms of Numerical values, of course, when you are using data sets, the numbers are going to be slightly different, but it is not a whole lot different. So new data is better. You use it, but if you use an older data, uh, then still you get basically the same elements as long as your methodology is the same. The problem with using longer data is, you know, certain things change during that 10-year time period. So you're assuming that this, this crossing stayed as crosswalk for 10 years. You realize that it didn't. For five years, it stayed crossbar. For year, five years, it stayed that. The la last coding tells you what is, exist what is existing. It doesn't tell you if it is flashing light. It doesn't tell you when it was converted from crossbar to flashing light. So that's when the, the further you go, the, the, the wider time period you take, the more error like that you are going to uh, basically bring in. Uh, So created model with the, those two adjustments, comparison of US DOT with zero inflated negative binomial. As you saw before, uh, models from here was much closer to the field data. Prediction value of those models were closer to the accident cons observed, closer, not exactly matching. And the relative ranking of uh, zero inflated negative binomial model identified they were more accidents in those crossings reflecting the real world data than other models. Uh, there's always more study to be done, okay? Um, if you look at uh, further detail in the, the, the accidents, you look at the other exposure measure, other variables, or other format of the variables. Uh, we were talking with, uh, with MINDAT people this morning, they were saying that, have you looked at approach to the crossing and the type of pavement they have versus the type of treatment they have on the surface. You know, many times you might have asphalt road leading to a concrete treatment at the crossing. Does that make any difference? So well, we haven't just looked at it to that level of detail. First of all, the database is not available. You have to gather that database, and that's very time-consuming. 
But, you know, no, no that it doesn't address all the issues, all the questions you might have. Uh, we combined all those four data sets for one, four states for one data set. And what we are doing now, we are saying that what if we do individual comparisons? Iowa alone, Texas alone, Pennsylvania alone. Would we get similar results? Would we get contradictory results? So we are looking at that at this point. I don't know what we are going to get. Because right now, we were trying to see that if you use national database, what we get. But I'm hoping that the same trends would exist. Uh, but we are looking at it. So we don't know the results of that. OK, thank you for your attention. I hope that I kept some time for question and answer. Is not available um, for the relative speed of the train or the speed limit on the road approaching the crossing. Do, do, do you have that data or is that not reported? The maximum timetable speed for the train is in the data sets. What they have told the train conductor that don't go faster than this. What actually did the train, what speed the train traveled at that crossing at that time, we don't know. And nobody knows. But we are hoping that whatever is scheduled, they are going to use that. But there might be some variations in the field. And follow up question. Um, your data that you presented there, particularly in, in your, I think, second, third, and fourth slide, uh, showed that um, the number of accidents that occurred at crossings um, was not much different than the number of crossings. By, by significant, they're, they're very close, mm -hmm. significantly, which mm -hmm. says that you get like one accident per crossing on what percentage of the crossings? It's got to be a very high percentage of crossings where you only have one accident a year. Um, I had that data. Let me see whether it is in there. There's a bunch of slides here. I'm sure they are here or not. I'll, otherwise, I'll give you rough estimates. No, it's not. Um, your point is, uh, the, the point you're observing is correct. The number of accidents are very close to the number of crossings, slightly higher. What does that tell you is that there's a lot of crossing that there, were, there was only one accident. Okay? There are limited number of crossings that there were two accidents, three accidents, four accidents. For example, we were looking at uh, Illinois data particularly. We had one location had six accidents. One location. Four locations had five accidents. Five locations had four accidents. And some location three. Some location two. Great majority of the rest is one. So multiple accidents do happen. But the number of locations with multiple accidents is limited. As you can see by comparing the total number of accidents versus total number of locations. The other question regarding that is what is the um, travel rate on the roads approach, or the travel rate of motor vehicles on the, the grade crossings, vehicles per day, vehicles per hour? Right. That's the one that, that the variable that we use, that, that AADT, and that's basically saying um, somewhere, this variable, the first one. So annual average daily traffic. That's average daily traffic. On average, how many vehicles we had. That average is coming from longer than a year becomes annual average daily traffic. So we know on average how many cars are using that road within 24-hour time period. Does on that an drive the, the multiplicity effect? Multiplicity effect, what do you mean by you that? Have multiple accidents at the same crossing. Uh, yeah, it's the same traffic volume creating that. So, so there is a correlation to the AADT and the number of accidents per year? Uh, not necessarily. If you rank the top AADT location, top AADT location, may not have the top number of accidents. It's a factor, but it is not a one-to-one. -one. It's not like I rank this AADT, top location is going to have highest number of accidents. No. We know that it is a factor. And the reason we actually did not use directly that value and we used log of that, 
it's just that value by itself is not determining it. Log of it is more, more important. Log of it considering actual number of trains. But it's a factor. If you, if you are saying that, okay, is a location that has AADT in, in 24 hour, a location that has 2,000 accidents, uh, is this similar to a location that has 20,000 accidents? No. 20,000 locations, chances are going to have more accidents than 2,000. But it's not that that's going to be 10 times more. Because there are a few other variables important. Yeah? Okay. Well, if I understand right, what the zero inflated uh, negative binomial tries to do is sort the crossings into like the true zeros and then those that got some positive expected number of accidents. Right. Any insight into what discriminates the zeros from the, the non-zeros? Well, if we don't make adjustment and if you stop there on this, just, uh, just the model, yeah, it does exactly what, what you said. Basically, it says certain locations don't have any accidents, certain locations has. Uh, those locations that they don't have accidents, usually they have lower ADT, lower train volume, okay? And basically, if your exposure measure is low, then chances are you are going to have lower accidents. Of course, the randomness plays a role, but in general, you're going to look at it and say the exposure measure is low. But when you apply the adjustment, one thing you realize is that actually the adjustment plays more important role than the, the zero inflated model outcome itself. So model outcome is one number, but the adjustment you are making to that number is actually larger than the number itself. So the number gives you one idea, but the adjustment is more important role than that. So. We have two questions from online. The first is, did you use a best fit tool to determine using that model, or did you try other models first through trial and error? No, typical, you know, statistical analysis, when you are doing model building, you know, you do regression analysis and you look at, for example, R square. This is the same typical, you know, forward moving stepwise regression we did, and then we assessed each variable role, and then we put the combinations and then see which one moves in and moves out. You now, for example, when we did not include AADT, number of lanes on the highway play the role. If you just say, is the number of lanes on the highway is a factor? It says yes. But if you say, if I put ADT and put that one, is the number of lanes important? No, it's not important. Because ADT is indirectly reflecting the number of lanes. Right? For example, you can't have 40,000 ADT on one lane road. By putting 40,000, you know that it's probably two, maybe even three per direction. So that takes care of it. So if you put those two together, basically one doesn't show, one doesn't add anything because the other one indirectly affected, showed the effect of the link, number of links. And the second question is, this person understands that most of the accidents occurred in Cook County and the surrounding area in Illinois. And what would be your recommendation to county planners? Minnesota's Cook County is Chicago, isn't it? Yes, we have a Cook County in Chicago, but this is the Cook County in, in Minnesota, right? This or, person said Cook County, Illinois. Oh, Cook County. Yeah. Well, uh, you know. Uh, is there a Cook County, Minnesota? There's a train in Cook County. 4,000 okay. people. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. But there's no active train lines in Cook County, are there anymore? I have no clue. Uh, we look at this way. If, right, okay. If you don't have great crossing in your county, would you have an accident in great crossing? No. If you have one great crossing at your county versus neighboring county that has a thousand, which one would have more accidents? Okay. Cook County has a lot of crossings. And Cook County also has a lot of high volume road and high volume train. So it's obviously that Cook County is going to have a lion's share of the accidents in Illinois because it has higher volume, more crossings, and then more exposure, basically, to the tra more train. Uh, so I'm not surprised. What recommendation do I have for that? Um, try to find out your highest location. Try to find out why that location has the highest number of accidents. And then try to look at it and say, what causes it? It's not in this model, but we have actually another tool that it ranks your crossings. Let's say we take Cook County data and give it to that. 
program. That program ranks the highest crossing, second highest crossing, third highest crossing, and tells you in the first highest crossing, first crossing, uh, the first crossing that the highest number of accidents, what is the most common element uh, among the accidents at that crossing? Let's say it happens to be highway speed, for example. So then you know at least one factor there that's contributing to this number of accidents there is speed, speed of highway. But if that's the case, you have a solution, right? Or if that's not, you have another one. And of course, site visits. In the study that's not again here is we found that there were nine accidents at one crossing in, in Chicago area. Then when we start looking at it, why there was nine accidents, and we talked to people, we didn't know. We just, the program gave us that. We start talking to people, did you know that? This is high accident location. They said, no. Yes, we know it. Say, so, do you know why? They ask us, do you know why? He said, all we know is it's close to intersection. It looks like queuing issue. Queues come, they said, yeah, it's exactly the problem. The queue backs up to the crossings. So some drivers are trapped there. Train comes and hits them and they don't have any place to go. And then that's a known problem that distance and excessive amount of queue that that distance cannot hold them is the common cause. So my, my recommendation would be, you know, identify the top locations and then send some crew to over there to do some field investigation and I'm sure they will come up with solutions. In another crossing, we found that, this is also in Chicago, we found that there were five accidents at that crossing, okay? The youngest driver involved in an accident was 61 years old. Youngest driver, okay? And four other drivers were older than 61. What more do you want? You know what I mean? What more do you want? You know what, what's happening. This is happening for older drivers. Why? Then we found out that there are a lot of community of older drivers there that there are a lot of residents, basically units around that. And naturally that on that crossing, there are a lot of older drivers. Now, we didn't do field investigation, but if you go back and do the field investigation and look at those accidents one by one, you're gonna find a pattern. Maybe these older drivers don't see it. Maybe the older drivers, they are too slow to react. Maybe your sign comes so sudden that they actually not processing that information, and all of a sudden they're on top of the crossings. But one thing is clear, all five accidents are older drivers and the youngest one is 61, it's telling you a lot. You have older population drivers problem at that location. It's not younger one, it's not average, it's not average crossing problem. So you can, you can get a lot by, by looking at a little bit detail into your data. Where you showed at the beginning of the presentation, you considered the AADT and train volume and the log of each and some of them, etc. At the end, you decided to use the log of AADT plus log of train volume. I'm curious to know um, uh, whether you have tested or do you have any insights if uh, if we added a product of the two to the existing term. Would it improve the um, prediction results by adding a um, multiplying effect right. nonlinear? We didn't do that because you we already know that if you use one variable twice, you start collinearity in your, and then collinearity is not good because it explains more. But the explanation is not because you selected good variables, because you use the same data, the same input variable twice. And as you keep doing that, if you keep adding more collinearity in your data, your prediction goes high and high, but statistically it's the wrong approach. So that's one reason we didn't want to include that. But in terms of which one of those exposure measures, whether additive, multiplicative, log of it, and so on, we basically looked at the outcome to see which one is showing a better exposure, <coughs> and that's why we selected log. USDOT is not using log. USDOT is using AADT itself. But we felt that looking at the AADT itself, log of ADT is better than that. We also noticed that we didn't take log of train because train volumes go from basically one to 100, 120. The range is very limited. ADT goes from 1,000, 400,000 to 
50,000, for example. So within that range, we thought that taking log of it and making it reasonable range has a better prediction. It showed better prediction, not that we thought. It showed better prediction. But if you take log of both, it doesn't show because then that 0 to 100 ends up being very narrow range. So, but we didn't add deliberately. Just we wanted to avoid that because I'm sure that if we do that, somebody is going to catch up. And they say, hey, you can't do that. That's, you know better than that. So. Any other questions? Well, please join me in thanking our speaker for the I would just like to remind you that next week uh, we will have a talk on development and demonstration of lane departure and advanced curve speed warning system to improve driver safety. Uh, be presented by Mohamed Faizan, who is a graduate student at the University of Minnesota Duluth. Uh, Professor Imran Hayi was originally supposed to be here, uh, but he had to be uh, overseas. And so uh, the graduate student who did most of the work will be here to talk about and present next week, same time, same place. I would like to ask all the registered students in the class to stay behind. We need to run a course evaluation, and we have a volunteer student who will be uh, conducting the course evaluation. Since I'm the host of this particular course, I have to be outside the room when you run the evaluation. So anyway, thank you very much. And again, last seminar is next week, and uh, look forward to seeing you all again then. Thank you. Students, please stay behind for a few minutes. There are two forms you have to demographic information are no longer being collected. This information will help us better understand how demographic...